morning. Try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. <laughs> there we go. I just had to hit myself in the tooth to turn it on. Well, Pastor Jeremy is not here, so we are just going to jump right in. Um, our first song is a verse that came to my mind. I was thinking about the song was Psalm 122, verse 1. And it says, I was glad, so glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And of course, we know this building is not the house of the Lord. In the new covenant, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the principle is the same. We have a special place to come together as a church body to worship God together. And that's a very, very special thing. And I hope that, uh, I know I wish I remind myself how how precious it is, how important it is, and what a privilege it is when so many people around the world cannot do this freely and without fear. So on that note, let's stand together and let's worship our Lord together this morning. Through every trial, through every circumstance, covers me through every battle I don't have to understand still I lift my voice and sing today tomorrow and forever I will live for you today tomorrow and forever on that note of forever, that's a good reminder that we'll be doing this together for eternity. I mean, we're doing lots of other things too, but can you imagine seeing each other around the throne of God and we're, remember, we always talked about this moment, you know, someday we would be up here around the throne of God together. I mean, that's a reality. It's awesome to think about. Let's think about that as we sing this, this old hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all sing Jesus, we'll sing and Shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll 
seated let's pray father god we thank you for these powerful truths that we're singing about this morning tune our hearts and our minds into your truth into the reality of of the words and let that sink deep into our spirit as we pull off the side of the road of life this sunday morning and just kind of reflect speak to us and meet with us we pray in jesus name amen good morning Thanks for joining us today, um, and happy Labor Day, or happy Labor Day weekend. Okay, hopefully not everybody has to work tomorrow. Um, just a reminder that our men's second Saturday breakfast will be September 12th, so that's next Saturday in the church base, FBT Center. We're going to move that to the FBT Center because of the um, uh, preschool downstairs. If you've been downstairs in the basement, you can see that preschool is all set up and ready to roll. So we're going to start doing our men's breakfast over at the FBT club or FBT center. FBT clubs is the next point. Um, is scheduled to begin September 16th. So we're getting close to our start date and it looks like we're going to be good to go. So we're going to continue on with that. Um, also there's been a change in the time frame. Uh, because of the rules regarding worship at the FBT Center, because it's not a sanctuary, they can't do their worship time. So that changes their schedule a little bit. So we're going to move it from 6.30 to 7.30. So it'll just be an hour long. Also, our FBT Club youth group will be here in this church sanctuary, and it'll also be an hour. So if you've got kids in both or you overlap, they'll all be from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, we're going to be looking at the school and the policies and try to have the safest environment. So you can read this little paragraph here, but we definitely need helpers. So um, we're going to continue on with our mission, and that's to um, bring people into a relationship with Jesus, and we're going to do that through our youth ministry. So we're going to push forward with that. Um, you can see here Beth, Bruce and Beth's new address is, uh, they actually have a P.O. Box 172 here in Fulton. Um, Tuesday, there's work being done at the Parsonage. And um, a lot of it is going really good. But on Tuesday morning from 8 to noon, um, there's going to be a work day at the Parsonage. And mostly what it's going to be is pulling nails, is what I'm told. So if anybody can has time on Tuesday morning from 8 to noon, you can sit on a chair and pull nails. Or you can encourage the people who are pulling nails. Then uh, that would be great. So I've heard that uh, there's a lot of laughter coming from that upstairs area up there. And, so um, it's coming together, and we're doing all this so that we can be ready when Pastor Jeremy brings his family um, in the end of October. So we've got a little bit of time, but in order to move forward with the next step, we've got to get those nails out, right? Okay, so Tuesday morning, if you're available. Um, one other thing, there's one to add to the back on the prayer list as we focus on this, is Pat Kingery. That's Alan Kingery's mom. Uh, Pat lives right out here in Fulton uh, off of 114, and um, she's in the hospital right now. I don't know what the illness is, um, but um, as we learn that information, we'll get that out to you. But please pencil in Pat Kingery. Um, we have lots of recoveries. Um, I know Adeline had her surgery this week, so you know please be praying for her. She had her tonsils out. Um, Gloria's back. Okay. And Gloria said, thank you for all the cards and prayers. So it looks like you're doing good. Larry doesn't look too beat up yet. He's, he gave a thumbs up, so he's okay. So, um, But we still need to be diligent for all of these um, prayer requests here. And um, one that's certainly there is our students and our teachers and um, just the wisdom as we approach this um, crazy season that we're in. So 
Um, if you can continue to pray for the wisdom of the church and definitely as it pertains to FBT clubs and youth groups. So, Is there anything else we need to add? Anything? Okay, the ushers will come forward. Nice game Friday, Sam. That was good. All right, let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this place where we can come and worship you. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to guide this church and the many projects that we have going, Lord. We just pray that you would give wisdom and to this project that we have over at the Parsonage, Lord. We just pray that you would continue to fill the need there for Pastor Jeremy and his wife and the family as they prepare to come and live there full time, Lord. We just pray that that project would continue to fulfill your will for this church and for Pastor Jeremy. Lord, we pray for our new FBT Center, Lord, as they try to get this work accomplished and get it started. Lord, we just pray that you would fill in the gaps of the schedule, Lord, that you would just put everything in line so that we can achieve the goal of, of having that mission here in Fulton uh, so that we can spread your word. Lord, we just ask that you would look over that project, Lord, that you would pull it together for your will. Lord, we just also ask that you would be a part of our FBT clubs as we join and start to gather our resources to spread the gospel here in this community through the children. Lord, we just pray for our leaders and for our, our youth group and, and for everybody involved in those Wednesday night services. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to lead and guide us to that we can share your will with those around us. Lord, today we, we pray for Pastor Jeremy and Tiffany as they are away from us, Lord. We just pray that you would be with them, Lord, and build them up through this time apart. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to give them safety and wisdom as they prepare to make their, room, or their move this way. Um, Lord, this morning we add Pat Kingery to our prayer list. Lord, we just ask that you would be with that family and um, be with Pat as she's admitted to the hospital, Lord. And we just ask for healing, uh, whatever the circumstances are, Lord. You know the circumstances, and that's all we need to know, Lord. We just give back a small portion of what we've been blessed with this morning in our offering. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to bless this money and help us to use it for your will, Lord. Let us be focused on Christ as we give this morning. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to be with this church. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You didn't have to stop it if you liked that song. Did, didn't want to cut you off. But I want to share, listen to these awesome words. I love these words from Psalm 18 as we kind of prepare ours to sing this next song. It says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock my fortress and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock. The Lord lives. Praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. Let's stand and worship him together. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real, death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty. To your heart, 
for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that on the one hand, you are the magnificent, great I am. We sit on your throne, you reign over the universe, and yet you are our friend, that we can take anything to in prayer, that we can talk with at any moment, closer than a brother, and we thank you and worship you for who you are this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We will now dismiss for Junior Church as well. Junior Church. Hey, this is good. I, I got up five minutes early. I know it's a holiday weekend, and I timed my notes, hopefully very accurately, to be done exactly 30 minutes, so we should get done at... Uh, 11.25. We'll see if it goes that well, but I know this church is stickler on time, so I try to be stickler on my notes. But uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. So I've been doing um, a read-through of the, of the Bible in a year, and I, I want to say I really appreciate the opportunity to share this morning with Pastor Jeremy being out for the next few Sundays. Uh, but I've been doing a read-through of the Bible in a year. It's a really cool plan, really interesting, a lot of reading, 
Uh, so you don't have time to slow down and dig into the details, but it, it's a good way to get a, a big picture perspective of the Bible because, of course, the Bible is one continuous story, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's a collection of stories, but it's also one solid continuous story. And one section I always find super interesting is the part about the different kings. So First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. I really enjoy history in general. And so, obviously, I really enjoy biblical history. And I'm a staunch believer in the famous quote. You may have heard it. I love this quote. It says, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And that is on the notes. And a quick uh, comment about the notes. This is for kids or maybe adults who are, are nodding off. There's a word search on the back, so as you uh, fill in the blanks for the, the notes, flip over to the back side and uh, take a second see if you can find that word, just something to keep you challenged and, and tied into the sermon, kids. So um, back to the point. Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And that applies, I think, whether it's thousands of years ago or whether it's just the generation before us, we need to be learning from and improving on what we see in the past. You know, I hope I'm a better dad than my dad. I hope my kids do better with their kids than I'm doing with them because we can continually learn not only from the positives, but also from from the negatives and hopefully learn from it, not repeat it, but actually improve and build on it. And that's part of the reason I really enjoy the history of the biblical king so much. The stories are very interesting. And there's a lot to learn for our day today. So on that note, I want to look at the life of Solomon this morning. So let's turn, if you're not already there, 1 Kings chapter 3. And Aaron's going to have, I think, the scriptures on the screen. If you just want to follow along on the screen, that's fine as well. And if I I apologize for talking too fast. But number one, I I do really love this. And I usually talk fast in that sense. But also, I don't want to go long on my time. So if I talk fast, I can say more and do it in less time. Um, And I I am actually going to attempt to cram a lot in this morning, so I want to apologize in advance, but to try to do Solomon's life in 30 minutes and talk about application points, it it was a bit of a stretch probably, but I'm going to attempt it. Hopefully it comes out well. Just push pause on Solomon for one second, because as we mentioned, the Bible being one continuous story, no matter where we start, unless it's Genesis 1-1, we're entering the middle of a story that's been going on for many, many years. So... um, before we jump in chapter 3, let's just get a little backstory. Um, and there's a slide in there about the, the dates of the kings and stuff. And you see where Solomon lines up, if you like that sort of thing. But just a little refresher, let's get on, on, the, on the page of the story. So when the Israelites left Egypt, you know, left as slaves uh, through the Red Sea, all the miracles, and they went through that nomadic lifestyle in the desert for a while, and then they entered the Promised Land. When they entered the Promised Land, they were ruled by judges, and the judge... A judge was not the same thing as the king. The judges, um, you might remember Samson, Gideon, Deborah. There were some female judges in there. They were military heroes. They were civil judges, um, sometimes even prophets like Samuel. But they didn't quite have the same role or the same power as a king would have. But it was during the time of Samuel, the last judge, that the the people of Israel said, we want a king. Uh, We want to be, actually what they said was, we want a king, we want to be like all the other nations around us, which was really tragic because that was the exact opposite of what they were called to do. God, first of all, was meant to be their king. They were kind of uh, meant to be set up as a theocracy, you could say. Um, God was their king. They had the temple and all the the Levitical laws and all all the rules and regulations for food and everything to kind of give civil law and order. And they were to be a theocracy ruled by God. And then they were to represent God to the rest of the world. But they got it backwards, and the world was influencing them. And they said, we want to be like all the other nations around us. Give us a king. Well, there's a big lesson in that that we won't dwell on, but I think you can see it. So God did give them what they asked for, and thus began the era of the king, starting with King Saul. Um, King Saul was a major disappointment. You probably read some of his stories, and we don't have time to go into that, but it is very interesting King Saul and his, his heir to the throne, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, is Jonathan, his son. They were both killed uh, by the Philistines, but that did open the, the way, open the door for God's chosen king, King David. He was a great king, good spiritual leader, made a share of mistakes for sure, but he was a good spiritual leader. He was a songwriter. He was a musician. He was a worship leader. A lot of the Psalms were written by him. The nation of Israel was 
overall spiritually healthy during his leadership, and uh, the nation was, was relatively strong. Then David was succeeded by his son, Solomon. And under Solomon's reign, Israel was the most blessed, wealthy, and prosperous as it had ever been. There were a lot of battles with neighboring countries during David's time, but a lot of that has subsided. There was a time of peace when Solomon became king, and they just started getting filthy rich, as we're going to see here in a minute. Um, so I want to jump in. Uh, verse 1, chapter 3 of First Kings. Just look at this first verse. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. So uh, to me, i got to push pause here because... This one verse, I think, shows how powerful of a work God has done in Israel. Egypt's former slaves, not just their, their, their workforce, their slaves, are now a fellow superpower. And I kind of see, um, you know, they're making alliances. I kind of see Israel and Egypt at this point almost like, you know, Great Britain and the U.S. They're superpowers in the world. But remember, they were like, <coughs> they were like the... The scum of Egypt's toes, if I could be crude like that. And now they're a fellow superpower. They're making alliances. Solomon has even married one of the daughters of Pharaoh. So it shows you what an amazing work that God's done in establishing this nation. Let's jump into verse 3 and read all the way to, we're going to, read all the way to 14. I'm going to do a lot of reading this morning. But I want to make sure we capture as much of Solomon's life. And this is really how he got started. It's really interesting. Verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the local places of worship. That was replaced by the temple, and we'll read about that later. The most important of these places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. That's pretty amazing. Solomon replied, You showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you, and you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I'm like a little child who doesn't even know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous that cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? Look at the Lord's response. The Lord was pleased that Psalm had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one has ever had or will ever have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me, and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Okay, imagine, try to, you got to use your imagination when you're, using, when you're reading scripture to try to put yourself into the story and really get everything that's happening here. Imagine God appearing to you and saying, what do you want? Ask for anything, and, and I'll give it to you. And not to be irreverent, but it makes me think of the genie and the lamp. My kids have been watching that movie, Aladdin, and it kind of makes me think of that. Solomon can ask for anything, but in humility, in humility, he asked for wisdom to be a good leader. And God was pleased with his request and said, I'm going to give you that great wisdom and everything else to go with it. So just to get a, a better idea of how blessed the nation became. Let's, uh, let's read some verses, get some snapshots, if you will, of their, of their prosperity. So let's jump over to chapter 4, and we'll see just how blessed <clears throat> they become. Chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. I'll read verse 20 and 21, and then 25 and 26. Let's pull out a few verses here. Verse 20, chapter 4. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the she- seashore, They were very contented with plenty to eat and drink. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms of the Euphrates River in the north 
to the land of the Philistines and the border of the Egypt and south. The conquered peoples of those lands sent tribute money to Solomon and continued to serve him throughout his lifetime. Jump to verse 25. During the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety. And from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, each family had its own home and garden. Not talking about the magazine home and garden. They had their own home and their home, own garden. And maybe for us, that may not jump off the page, but you think about where they came from in that time and just all the upheaval and, you know, nations would fall, nations would rise. To have your own home, your own garden, they were very prosperous. They were very blessed is, is the point of that. Uh, let me read, let's see. Oh yeah, look at verse 26. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his chariot horses and he had 12,000 horses. Now, let's translate this to modern day. That's like a giant garage full of classic cars, sports cars. You know he didn't ride 12,000 horses, but that was like, you know, collector's item. I mean, he, he had all this wealth and all the, just the cavalier lifestyle that went with it. And, you know, it just wasn't economic prosperity either. Uh, this was an exciting time for them religiously. We won't go into it, but chapters 5 and 6, we see Solomon constructing or overseeing the construction of the temple. Um, that was the central place, became the central place for the entire nation to come together and to worship. And so, you know, religiously, they were, they were prospering. They were being established. Um, their wealth, of course, continued to grow. I want to read just another snapshot here. If you jump all the way to chapter 10, 1 Kings chapter 10, I want to read verse 14. And then we'll read a couple other ones. Just listen to this, or you can follow along on the screen. 1 Kings chapter 10, listen to verse 14. Each year, Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. All right, now jump, jump to verse 21. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. So their wealth just keeps multiplying. Uh, the king, yeah, let's keep reading. The king had a fleet of trading ships of Tarshish that sailed with Hiram's fleet. Once every three years, the ships returned loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. I can imagine what his palace was like with apes, peacocks, gold, silver, ivory, everywhere. Oh, uh, lost my place again. Verse 23, so King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. People from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year, everyone who visited him brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. One more, let's read verse 27. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone, and valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Okay, so I think we're getting the picture. That's my goal. Try to get our, our imagination going, kind of picture what his life was like. He was, as we say, filthy rich. The nation as a whole, though, I shouldn't say filthy rich, because they were truly blessed. They were blessed by God. They had everything they needed and everything they wanted, pretty much. So stop here and ask, is, is this a problem? Is there anything wrong with being that prosperous, that blessed? Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, or 1 Timothy 6, 10 says that the love of money, we often misquote this verse, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil, but the love of money. And then James 1, 17 is another good one to think about. It says every good thing is a gift, a gift from God. So every good thing is a gift from God. The nation of Israel was blessed by God. Their plenty was a gift from God. You know, when we think of, of ourselves today, those of us who have a home, who have a refrigerator, who have air conditioning, who have food ready to eat, who have a closet with clothes, that's, I mean, we're better off than 90% of the world if we're in that category. And so we're rich in that sense. We're blessed. And that's, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a blessing from God. But there is a warning that comes with all this blessing. Applies to us and applies to Solomon here. And God gave, the interesting thing is God gave the people of Israel this warning way before they entered the promised land. So if you're following your Bible, keep your finger here on 1 Corinthians 
10, but jump back all the way to Deuteronomy 8. So think about where the nation of Israel is very blessed, very wealthy, very prosperous, very comfortable and, and happy. But let's go back and look at something God said in Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. Let's read verse 11 to 14. This is the words from the Lord. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord, your God, and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and your gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. So what's the warning? Do not forget. <clears throat> do not forget. In the midst of your blessings, do not forget. Chapter 11, as we continue moving chronologically through Solomon's story, is when we begin to see the tide turn in Solomon's heart. And this prosperous life he's been living takes a toll on him. And he does exactly, as Deuteronomy says, he forgets what life is all about. So let's read a few more verses to see the transition in his heart and his life. First Kings 11, I'm going to read 1 to 6 in verse 9. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives. I don't know how that's possible. I'm still learning how to be a good husband to one wife. But he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines of the 700 wives weren't enough. In fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turn his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God, as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Thedonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David had done. And lastly, jump to verse 9. The Lord was very angry with Solomon. And notice this. For his heart, Solomon's heart, had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. What a tragedy. Solomon, the wisest man in all the earth, acting so foolishly, even to the point of worshiping other gods. Okay, so I know we've jumped around. We've read a lot of verses. We did a quick drive-through of something that we probably could have, you know, taken a very long time on. But that is a quick snapshot of Solomon's life. Now, Important question. What does any of us, any of this have to do with any of us? Um, what's the lesson for us today? Well, first off, don't marry 700 wives. No. Now, how can we learn from history so that we don't repeat it? What are the lessons from Solomon's life? And I've picked three because every sermon has three points, right? There's probably a lot more. So I would encourage you if you, you know, maybe you want to read the Bible more, but you're like, I don't know where to read. Pick up on this story. There's a lot more we could talk about and come up with your own lessons from Solomon's life. But three jump out clearly at me, and we're going to go through these to finish our time. Number one, clearly seen, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. And the funny thing is, this is from Ecclesiastes 6.9. These are the words of Solomon. And there's a little bit of debate on when he wrote Ecclesiastes, if he wrote it at the end of his life, which means maybe he repented shortly before his death. Um, so there's some debate on that, on when he wrote it. But either way, the point is, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. We won't read it for sake of time, but it's pretty interesting in Deuteronomy 17, 16 and 17. Many years before Solomon, God gave three specific warnings to future kings. Number one, he said, do not build, and this, again, way before Solomon, do not build large stables and buy horses from Egypt and start stockpiling them. 
He said, number two, do not take many wives, especially from foreign nations, because they'll turn your heart away. And he said, number three, do not store up large amounts of gold and silver. It almost is like Solomon read the script and thought, okay, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what God says not to do, because Solomon was guilty on all charges of those warnings from God. A psalm was all about more, 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 more gold, more horses, more wives. You know, when you think about it in our own day, who are the people that kind of have everything of the American dream? It's Hollywood, right? They have everything in Hollywood. So at least that's what we think. And yet, oftentimes, people like that are the most miserable. And if that's not a lesson to us that having everything does not bring you satisfaction, I mean, you will never be full. You can eat and eat and eat and never be full. And we may not, you know, relate to maybe someone in Hollywood or we may not relate to Solomon, but this principle is the same on a smaller scale, even in our little sleepy town here. It's that, that temptation to chase things. And, and again, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with material things. James 1.17, every good thing is a gift from God and we should enjoy the blessings. But as we read, Solomon's own testimony in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see how meaningless, how meaningless our life becomes when we chase after material things. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.10, again, it says, those who love money will never have enough. It'll never be enough. And that's pretty much the entire theme of Ecclesiastes is that it's chasing after the wind. You can never catch the wind, right? It's chasing after the wind to pursue material things, to pursue money, to pursue all this stuff. But in contrast to all that, Paul says in Philippians 4, I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret of being content in all situations. So there's a secret. There's a method to being content. And that that secret, it's gratitude, isn't it? Gratitude is the killer of, of greed, of constantly longing for more. When gratitude and thankfulness are our focus, we find that we're content with what we have instead of constantly longing for, for more. But Solomon, again, was just had to have more and more and more. I wonder if he even enjoyed the things that he had. And I have to uh, poke at my kids here. I don't know if your kids do this, but sometimes I see them, you know, really want this toy and save up and try to do odd jobs, do, do chores, get some money, buy this toy. But the newness wears off pretty quickly, doesn't it? And then, well, actually, this next one is going to be even better. And so they save up and, you know, the cycle. And we see that, obviously, in kids. But don't we adults kind of do the same thing? You know, we, we kind of do an adult version of that. And we pursue something. We get it. And we're, we're not quite as happy as we thought we'd be with it. But we, we still fall prey to that next one. You know, we just get the next one. Get the next one. But the lesson here is enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. And I've made it a goal, not always successful, but I've made it a goal to frequently stop and appreciate what I have and and what and who even is around me and practice gratitude and enjoy and appreciate what we have. And when we do that, we find that we, we are satisfied, we are content, even without getting that next thing. All right, the second point really piggybacks on the first one. The second one is beware of distractions. Did you notice in chapter 4, or in verse 4, sorry, verse 4, chapter 11, it said, in Solomon's old age, that's when his heart turned from the Lord. So this tells me it was probably a gradual shift um, because we see how great he started out. I mean, he was humble. He was pursuing the Lord. He was asking for wisdom to be a good leader. He was doing great. But then distractions begin to set in. My dad, it made me think of a sign my dad used to have. It, it said, it was in his office for years. It says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Have you ever heard of that saying? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. You remember God's warning from Deuteronomy 8 that we read earlier. Don't forget. In your blessing, in your plenty, don't forget. And I would add for us today, in your busyness, don't forget the Lord. My family, maybe like a lot of yours, is in that extremely busy stage, you know. Soccer practices and soccer games, and, you know, of course, I work over 40 hours a week, and Abbey Homeschools, we have a full plate, and they have different things with church activities mixed in there, and life is really busy, and there's nothing wrong with all those things. They're good things, but the warning is the same. In your blessing, in your plenty, in your busyness, don't forget the Lord, and What do you think that phrase, think about that phrase, don't forget the Lord. What do you think that really means? For me, 
in the past, that would have meant, okay, I would have taken it the wrong way. Okay, I got to be more disciplined. Um, you know, I got to make sure I really have that quiet time in the morning, 30 minutes to an hour, reading and praying. And I, and I do that, and that's important, and I would recommend everyone do that. But I don't really think that's what the warning is about. Don't forget the Lord. Because that can just add to your busyness sometimes. I got to read these three chapters. And I think the, the warning, don't forget the Lord, is in the midst of your busyness, not just that time in the morning or not just Sunday mornings, but in the midst of everything you're doing, the soccer practices, the, the FBT clubs, you know, the, the, the school activities, it's remembering what the point of all that is. It's keeping the main thing the main thing. For example, it's remembering when you're running to soccer practice, it's not just about soccer. It's about investing in your kids' lives. It's about their social health. It's about their physical health and development. It's we talked about this a couple nights ago. It's when you're sitting at the dinner table, remember, it's not actually just about eating right now. This is about connecting as a family. And so I think this, this warning to not forget is, is remembering that why we do what we do. Why do we come to church? Like, what is the point? Is this just another thing? Because it's Sunday, it's Sunday morning, it's what we're supposed to do, it's on the schedule. No, like, what's the actual point? What's the main purpose of this? And then, of course, t- to ask, are we accomplishing that thing? It's remembering why we do what we do and remembering what the Lord really wants from it. The ultimate purpose of everything, and I think that everything is tied to, the ultimate purpose is be one of three things, our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and our own spiritual, mental, emotional, mental health. So those three things, those are the only three things that are eternal. Those are the only three things we carry over into the next life. Those are the, the main things, and the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So we can't get sidetracked with all the distractions and forget why we do what we do. Last one, the last lesson. I'm going to end it here. Number three, guard your heart. We need to remember that the ultimate goal of our enemy isn't just to get us distracted, isn't just to get us you know, caught up with material things or greed or whatever. The ultimate goal of the enemy is to capture our hearts. To turn our hearts away from the Lord. We see in verse 9, chapter 11, the saddest verse in the everything I read, it says Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord. Remember his dad, David, made some colossal mistakes, ugly, ugly sins. But in the end, his heart was still for the Lord. He repented with tears, and his heart was still for the Lord. But Solomon's heart turned from the Lord. So the, the, the verse for this point, huge verse, I love this verse. It's been a life verse. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. It determines the course of your life. We need to do a heart check from time to time. You know, infection on the surface is one thing, but when that infection gets below the surface of the skin and whatnot, it gets into our bodies and starts to spread, it becomes really, really serious. And if you don't keep your priorities in check, and if you don't live a life free, you know, be wearing of, of distractions and that kind of thing, if you don't take time to maintain healthy relationships, especially with those in your immediate home, your immediate household, you'll find that all that stuff creeps in and it gets below the surface, gets deeper into the core of your life and into the heart of your life, and then it's that much harder to, to recover from. So don't let it get to that point. You know, we, we keep things in check on a daily basis. We deal with it on a daily basis. Solomon, we see how well he started out, actually really great. And I'm sure there were, there were multiple warning signs along the way that he missed, that he ignored. And, and honestly, I think in my own life, uh, there were some really unhealthy issues in my relationships with God, with my wife, and with my dad, those three particularly, for years that either because I didn't see it or I just failed to address it, it, it got worse and worse, deeper into the surface, deeper into the heart of my life, and to the point where I got to a point of breakdown, a point of disillusionment. And it changed, honestly, it changed, completely changed the course of my life. And that had to happen, and you know, I don't necessarily regret that, but what if I would have dealt with that sooner? What if I would have hit it when it was still on the surface level and, and you know, gone the healthy approach? before the infection got too deep. So the point is to guard your heart and to fill your heart with God's truth and then let God lead your heart. All right, so those are three lessons from Solomon's life, and that's a 30-minute drive-through of, of Solomon's life and some lessons we can learn from it. Um, 
I'm going to be filling a couple Sundays until Jeremy comes back. Next Sunday, we're going to look at a guy named Jeroboam, who actually has a really interesting connection to Solomon. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about his life and what we can learn from his life. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the stories. I know I connect with stories. I love listening to stories and then learning from them. And we look at Solomon's life, and I see a lot of application for my own. And I pray that you would help us to be aware of those distractions. Help us to enjoy and appreciate what we have and not get caught in that trap of longing for more. And help us especially to guard our heart, to protect our heart, and to keep our heart pure and open before you. And Lord, may we uh, finish, not just start strong, but finish strong. As we see in Solomon's life, how derailed he got by even the good things, even the blessings that you gave him. We don't want to be distracted. We don't want our blessings to turn into curses. Lord, we want to appreciate what we have, but keep focused on what's most important. Help us to do that and empower us to do that today, tomorrow, this week, this year, and our whole lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for letting me share this morning. Have a great Labor Day.